Welcome to another episode of the Movement Dow podcast. I'm your host, Felix Zander, and I'm joined today by Gabriel Shipton, one of the founders of Assange Dow, which today I, I believe is the most successful one week fundraiser in um, Juicebox history. Gabriel, how are you doing? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm good, Felix Zander. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Yeah. And thank you for taking the time. I know you're, you're in Europe now getting out the word, and I know there's a new documentary that came out about Julian Assange that uh, you've also been spreading out uh, all over. So tell us what, what you're up to lately and how it's been going. Yeah, well, I'm a bit, for the last month, we've been traveling around the UK uh, with this documentary. It's called Ithaca. Uh, it's about Julian's dad and his wife, Julian's wife, and their fight to free him. It's a sort of um, humanistic uh, look at, at, at the Julian uh, what's going on to Julian? I'm trying to um, tell a very personal side about how his family and he uh, experiences his persecution. So we've been, you know, touring around the UK. I think we've done 14 or 15 um, Q and A screenings, um, getting in front of a huge range of people all over all over the country here, from you know in the north of Scotland, all the way down to Brighton, to the West Country. Uh, yeah, all over. It's awesome. What has the reception been so far? Look at the Q and A's with the general public. Yeah, really, everyone's really moved. Um, you know, uh, people uh, become are uh, becoming quite angry about what's going on. You know, people who didn't really know or who tuned out about the story. Um, you know, it's a good way for them to come back in and and get updated to find out you know what's going on and, and what's at stake. Um, you know, in, in Julian Assange's case. Uh, but yeah, people, generally people are very moved uh, and and more informed, and and some some people get flipped, you know, like they they come out and they come out of the film, and and a lot of the things that they used to believe or, or were told or, or might have read about in like mainstream or legacy media uh, are, are all flipped on their head. So <laughs> some people's worlds are sort of torn apart when they when they um, when you scratch the surface of this thing. Yeah, I have to say, I remember when Assange Dow came on the scene. By came on the scene, I, I believe it started in December of last year, but in February, it really exploded. I remember reading about it, and for me, I had not heard much about Julian Assange kind of recently at that point. And then when I read about it, I mean, it, it just had like a bonkers fundraise. I mean, I think, I think in four days or something, it raised over $40 million, which is absolutely insane. And I remember wondering kind of, you know, where this all came from. Like, it's almost like you tapped into, I don't know if it was a mood or it was like a perfect storm where you could harness all of this energy and people just, you know, started um, donating. So uh, I guess, what was that experience like? And I think for many people, Assange Dow, the question is, you know, how, how do you scale when something happens that quickly? Particularly a lot of people listening here who might have DAOs or be thinking of making one. Um, and, and I will say, in my opinion, it seems like it's impossible to scale something that happens that quickly. But what was that experience like being at the center of that storm? Yeah, we, we just, you just, uh, you know, it's hard to describe, but, you know, it's, it's like riding a bull. Um, you know, you just got to hold on for dear life and then hope, well, not hope, but, you know, <laughs> you've got to hold on and, and ride it all the way home, basically. Um, you know, we we had started looking at an NFT collaboration uh, for Julian as 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 a way to raise funds. We started looking at that all the way back in May 2021. And that's when we started working on that, um, you know, Puck and Julian collaborating together on uh, on Julian's first NFT, uh, which ended up being the Censored Collection um, that uh, the Dow, the Dow, uh, Assange Dow purchased um, the one of one from that collection. But we were working on that for a very long time. Um, and then on the 10th of December, uh, end of 2021, the High Court in the UK ruled that Julian could be extradited um, to the US to face uh, 17 charges uh, of espionage for basically for publishing uh, this material that was leaked by Chelsea Manning. So that's the Iraq war logs, the Afghan war diary, the cables, uh, Guantanamo Bay Detainee files, yes, and the uh, cable set, 250,000 diplomatic cables. Uh, from the U.S. State Department. And so Julian's been charged with publishing that information, and 
in the US and the UK just ruled that he would, the High Court ruled that he could be extradited. And so there was this global outrage at that at that point in time. And uh, some of the people who were involved in Constitution Dow uh, and also in Ross Dow started saying, well, you know, why don't we have a free Assange Dow? You know, why isn't there a free Assange Dow yet? And so that sort of uh, launched the ball rolling on free Assange Dow. Now, and it wasn't until uh, you know, next year, three months later, that, that the Dow launched around the NFT uh, auction. So it was this sort of combination of, you know, an NFT auction, um, this anger around this extradition ruling, and also the Dow, um, you know, the Dow structure that really catapulted um, catapulted this raise into into something that, you know, had, had never been seen before. Absolutely. And I think too, you know, one of the one of the most harrowing things that can happen in a DAO happened in a Sanj DAO, which is that there was disagreement among among the multisig. Now, this is something that anybody who's starting a DAO is, is scared to death of, right? Because that's just the core. Um, at the same time, it seems like everybody on the multisig, from what I've read, and, and you know, they all in their hearts seem to be in in on the Julian cause, so to speak. Um, and you can, of course, correct me if I'm wrong, but the question was, you know, what, what was, I guess, long-term strategy like, and when you were forming the DAO, is that, did those discussions happen or where did those differences of opinion emerge along that process? Yeah. So I guess, you know, like you're saying, this, this incredible growth, uh, you know, over three days, this, um, you know, rocketing growth, over 10,000 contributors, uh, you know, basically this instant instant 10,000 member community, right? Uh, you know, that was over three days, um, you know, formed around this DAO. And so there was also a lot of, you know, I think 17,000 ETH, around 17,111 ETH um, that was contributed by these 10,000 people. And so we were, we were following along a path, you know, this, this pathway that, that we'd um, come up with, you know, this sort of simple pathway that, you know, this DAO was going to bid on this NFT. Uh, it was a, it was a very simple. You know, we sort of cut it down and made it as simple a simple ask as possible for people. So, so it was so it was easily understandable. And you know, along the way, uh, you know, we're all um, volunteers. You know, we're we're all. Um, you know, none of us were paid. Um, some of us had been involved in DAO DAO before. Myself, I had not. Uh, but. Yeah, we were all, you know, working, you know, working in good faith, basically, that we're all there together for the same reason, as you say, we're all there um, to help Julian, to free Julian, basically, to, to work towards that. And so once we, we got to a sort of this critical stage when the auction, uh, there was a two-day auction for this one of one piece, and so we're, the, the auction clock was ticking, right? And, and we were at this sort of critical stage where, you know, the Dow had made a few bids, uh, and we had, we had, we did have a counter bidder at that time. And then there was, um, you know, this disagreement, uh, basically in the multi sig, whether, you know, the Dow would retain funds or, or we would push forward with the, the with the pathway that we, you know, had outlined, um, you know, in the sort of, uh, constituting documents, if you will, of, of the Dow. So that, you know, the website, the sub stack and the Twitter. Yeah. And that, and that, and that early um, strategy was, Whatever you raise, you're going to throw at this bid to go into a legal fund. That was the beginning strategy, or, or is that accurate to say? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. So whatever we whatever we raised would would go on bidding, would go on bidding for Julian and Puck's, you know, first or Julian's first NFT, the collaboration with Puck, and then uh, that flow would then go um, to uh, a foundation in Germany, which is the Well Holland Foundation, which has. Um, you know, been funding a lot of Julian's legal fees and uh, campaign fees over the years. Mm. Um, so this, that was the sort of pathway uh, that we had set out. And that's, that's what ended up happening. You know, the, there was um, a couple of members of the, of the um, multi-sig who uh, didn't, didn't think that was the best, you know, the best way, the best way to channel the funds. They wanted to uh, keep the funds uh, within the DAO. Uh, and and have the Dow manage uh, manage the funds, but that was you know I think you know uh, in hindsight I think we've done I think we've done the right thing you know the the this how to this catapulting huge success Dow the success of a Dow 
uh, and and the ten thousand community members, you know, just <laughs> trying to manage a community of ten thousand. Everybody who know who's ever uh, had a, or you know who's ever been part of a DAO knows that um, you know com- managing community is incredibly hard, right. and uh, managing a, managing a huge community, uh, a, you know, one of the largest DAO communities uh, with people from all over the world. You know, I think we had maybe twelve languages in the Discord, right? So we're talking about this massive worldwide community um, that had all come together to, to um, you know, to cr- contribute to Julian's defense. But it, it's it's an incredible challenge. And, and I think, you know, in the future, there, there needs to be more tools developed to, to, you know, basically manage these huge, huge communities like that. Uh, I think that, you know, you know, these language tools as well, you know, communication tools, uh, as well as more secure uh, secure communication tools rather than these proprietary softwares like uh, like Discord and things like that. Yeah. yeah, and that's actually exactly where I was going because I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast either, either have a DAO or might want to make one. And when they plan that out, I mean, the question is, you know, you, you're that first time you do it, you know, do you really know what you're doing? And, and nobody does. But, you know, when that first time gets really successful, as is the case in Assange DAO, you know, what safeguards does one put in place? In this case, with your, with Assange DAO's winding down the disagreement in the multisig, uh, do you think that that was avoidable in any way? Or was that just just a product of the complete frenzy that comes out of a fundraise that's so successful so quickly? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it could have, you know, looking back on it, um, could it have been avoided? I'm not sure. You know, we... we <laughs> I, I, I personally had never met any of the multi-sig face to face. You know, uh, I guess that's that's the same for a lot of people. Um, Which is incredible, uh, by the way. I think it's it's incredible yeah. to think of that that a group of people can have so much success raising money and have never met in person even once. I mean, that's just mind blowing. Yeah. yeah, I since have met them, but uh, I since have met 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 them, but, but at the time <laughs> we would only um, chatted online. So you know, and they're very honourable. You know, our multi sig members, you know, incredibly honourable people. You know, even though we did have a disagreement, um, there was uh, this real sense that you know, let's uh, you know, however this goes down, let's follow uh, what how we implemented the DAO. Let's follow the constitution of the DAO, uh, and th- and that was the sense the whole time that even though there was a disagreement, that we would go back to uh, how the DAO was constituted, how it was. You know how it was uh, the flow on the website, um, you know, decision tree on the website, and all that sort of stuff. That we would go back and, and honor that. So I have to give a, you know, an incredible amount of credit to uh, everyone on the Assange DAO uh, multi sig for being, you know, just amazingly honorable. They're, they're, with that amount of funds at stake, um, it, things could have gone incredibly wrong. But I, I think they, in the end, um, you know, these funds are in, in the place uh, where Julian can, can use them for his defense. And, right. and that is the main thing of the Dow. It's funny. I mean, it's almost like, you know, the Supreme Court's been in the news a lot in America lately because of the Roe versus Wade overturning. But it's almost like you guys had to adopt this originalist versus textualist view, right? Of how do, you, how do we move forward? And you fell back on, I mean, I, guess, I suppose it's nice to have the foresight to write a document and put things in place that did outline a strategy. I think the scary thing is, you know, when people get together and, and they don't, they don't outline stuff, that's when you can, that, that's when a multi-sig disagreement like that can be truly catastrophic, right? Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think, you know, if we had have gone with the other side, which was, you know, open up, uh, you know, open up voting in the multi-sig, open up voting to the community, you know, engage the community on, on, on what their wishes are. Um, I think everybody who knows or has any experience with Dow, Dow governance and things like that. If you form a community in three days of ten thousand people with twelve different languages, you know, opening up for, opening up for a vote is just uh, going to be insanely chaotic. Especially when you uh, don't have this uh, robust governance structure in place um, to to sort of manage the outcomes of those votes. Uh, I think you know. I think we really made the right decision, um, and that uh, you know the the funds uh, they're where they need to be. Uh, for Julian, Julian to be able to instruct his lawyers uh, to be able to campaign as hard as he can. I mean, it's totally expanded now. You know, they, Julian used to have 
uh, legal aid lawyers, you know, who would, um, you know, not be prepared and things like that. And, and that's, that's all going to change now. The, 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 the people who he's able to get for his defense are now the best, the best of the best. And he's been able to, previously all the resources, uh, were focused on the UK. So now he's been able to, uh, start fighting the case in multiple jurisdictions uh, and launch campaigns in, in Australia. We've had a hugely, hugely um, successful campaign in Australia, which has seen the current government in Australia is now changed its tune. They're, they're saying the Prime Minister has said that enough is enough, you know, and, and that he doesn't see what purpose is served in Julian staying in prison. And and these are sort of all effects of, of the Assange, uh, you know, the Assange Dow. Uh, raise and um, the donation that was made to well Holland. Do you feel also like part of this is as people, as people get more distance between the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you take a sober look at kind of a lot of the mistakes that were made, um, that you know they start thinking. Well, I mean, exposing some of that, which is what what WikiLeaks did, Julian's organization. E- even if before you were saying, you know, and kind of realizing that. Because the argument with this was that, um, you know, national security interests were in danger, people's lives were put in danger. As far as I'm aware, and I have researched this, nobody can point to an instance where that's true. So do you think part of it is as time goes on and people realize, you know what, there was kind of a lot of shit show going on over there and exposing it, you know, didn't really seem to put anyone's lives in danger and national security interests, that people are softening also for that reason? Yeah, and I think, you know, Julian's been in prison now for three years, you know, um, in a maximum security prison. You know, he's in there with uh, terrorists, uh, murderers, you know, uh, these are the sort of hardened criminals, you know. He he doesn't, he has never even got a parking ticket. I think people can see, like, why is this guy being punished in this way? You know, what, what's actually going on here? Yeah. Uh, so it becomes... Yeah. Sorry, go on. It becomes so stark. It becomes so stark, and and the hypocrisy becomes so obvious um, to to normal, principled people. Uh, and yeah, as you say, nobody was harmed. You know, the, the actual the um, generals in Chelsea Manning's in Chelsea Manning's um, court proceeding actually admitted that that uh, as a result of Chelsea Manning's leaks, no one, nobody was harmed. There was no harm. And so, important, also important to mention, Chelsea Manning is is free now. Yes, the torture sentence was commuted in 2016. Yes. So yeah. there's there's also, I think, a question of why Julian remains incarcerated. I mean, I guess the one thing, and I'd love for you to respond to this, but, you know, the cynical way of looking at this, which I think a lot of people take this view, they would say, you know, Julian Assange embarrassed, you know, the strongest country in the world really, really badly and repeatedly by leaking, you know, evidence of, whatever of whether it's corruption whether it's waste whether it's just you know diplomatic cables that embarrassed a lot of uh, a lot of diplomats so the argument is you know he's getting punished for embarrassing a lot of important people and <clears throat> legal, legally he doesn't have a leg to stand on he, like if he does it doesn't matter because you know they're i mean what what's the thing they're trying to get him now for it's a, it's like a 100 year old law so in other words yeah the espionage act yeah. right, the espionage act and so so the cynical point of view says, well, you know, what's the point in even putting putting money into a defense when it doesn't seem like legally he has a chance because because he he's up against, you know, so he's up against someone who's not playing fair. Um, what what do you respond to that argument? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you know, even though you know the legal process is filled with irregularities, you know, it's a um, it's been corrupted top to bottom, you know, exploiting every single, you know, from the extradition treaty, um, you know, from, uh, you know, the, the extradition treaty has been exploited. Um, they've used evidence from uh, an, an Icelandic witness uh, that has since recanted. Um, you know, the CIA, uh, the CIA, there's now proof that the CIA had recordings of Julian's meetings with his lawyers. Uh, with his doctors from inside the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, there's sources from within the CIA that actually have come out saying there was plots to kidnap Julian and plots to murder Julian that were, that were being drawn up within the CIA. So, mm. I mean, all this, all this stuff is, 
is it's just they just fall on top of each other, and and you can see you know the the lengths that people go to to uh, keep Julian where he is. But I think he does deserve the best legal defence uh, that money can buy. You know, at the end of the day, like it, that's going to make a difference. You know, it, it, even though it, it, he's stuck in this system, if he doesn't have the best defence, then things are worse for him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, then then we're not able to fight this. Uh, fight this battle properly, and you know I don't think it's just about um, these leaks. Uh, you know the Chelsea publishing the Chelsea Manning leaks. You know what Julian and the people at WikiLeaks created uh, was a total uh, like decentralisation of information. You know what used to be uh, controlled by the legacy media, by the corporate media. Uh, they would get a leak, uh, they would write an article on it. Uh, the public would never be able to see that leak, right? So you would never be able to, all this information was all centralized behind these corporate media entities. And so what, what, how Julian revolutionized that is, okay, we're going to make source documents available to everybody. So now, now you have this ability to do this scientific form of journalism where uh, you can hold up the article and you can look at the source document and you can say, well, actually, uh, you know, this article, you, you've only, you've only taken these bits or, you know, you can sort of, peer review um, the corporate media <laughs> in a way um, that was never possible before. Yes. And so it's this using tools of encryption, using the architecture of the internet. Uh, he created, um, he created this, uh, this system uh, that, that totally tore apart the way that populations are um, made to, you know, uh, are made to, you know, vote for wars or, well, you know, wars, people don't like wars, right? Like, uh, wars have to be sold to people. And traditionally, they were sold to people uh, through the corporate media, through the legacy media. And now Julian came along with WikiLeaks, and all of a sudden, uh, that turned that model for, for selling these things to the public on its head. So he is very dangerous in that sense. You know, uh, WikiLeaks is like this this sort of nuclear bomb that, that, that um, Julian created uh, or this, um, you know, the way to sell wars to populations, and so I think that is more part of why he's been uh, persecuted the way he is. You know, if you use if you use technology, if you use uh, the internet to really uh, go up against our power, then then this is what will happen to you. Right. Yeah, and so that's. I've, I mean, I've I've run into this argument a lot too that he's essentially being made an example of of what happens, um, you know, when you, when you take a path like that, it's interesting because there's so many parallels, you know, if you look at what he did for, for information, it's, there's so many parallels with, with, you know, web three and blockchains and decentralization, right? I mean, because part of the, I think the beauty of WikiLeaks was that when it was working properly, he had no idea who submitted the documents, right? I mean, that was the whole point that he could not even be compelled to reveal sources because he didn't know who they were. He just got this chunk and, and people could now vet this or not vet this or whatever. And I know at a certain point when, when WikiLeaks was attacked, they did spread it out, I think, across multiple servers, right? Which is exactly the point of true decentralization so that this, that this dump of documents couldn't just be erased, which, you know. Yes, that's right. And went out onto torrent services and everything. Exactly. So, so I guess what is the state of of the case now, you know, so one thing, the question of, I mean, certainly with the Assange Dow raise, there's no shortage of funds for the best defense, but let's say that this happens, you know, the order to extradite Assange was, was most recently approved from what I read. And I don't Mm -hmm. know how many more chances he has to fight that. If he came to the United States and, you know, was compelled to stand trial in the United States with the best lawyers on earth, do you think he would get a fair trial? Yeah, look, I think, I think, uh, you know, I, I think they would do everything in their power not to, uh, not to have a fair, you know, not to have a fair trial for Julian. You know, there would be secrecy, there would be um, closed courts. You know, Julian would be kept in what's called special administrative measures or communications management unit. You know, some really, really harsh prison conditions that you know they put uh, people like El Chapo in. You know, the, yeah. that's the sort of prison conditions that Julian Julian would be kept in. And which the, those conditions were actually found by doctors here in the UK, whose evidence was accepted by the magistrate. Those prison conditions would 
uh, were found to they would have um, compelled Julian to to take his own life. So that is that is the sort of greatest fear at the moment that he won't even make it to a trial. Mm. You know, if he if, if extradition becomes becomes imminent. So on the 17th of June, the UK Home Secretary here, Pretty Patel, signed off on Julian's extradition. Uh, and Julian has one more chance to a- apply to appeal to the High Court. And so that appeal has gone in, and it is a very, very wide-ranging appeal. It's got 16 points, uh, 16 appeal points in it. You know, it just throw because this is the last chance here in the UK, so the UK judicial system. So we're really throwing everything at it, and 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 that has been possible because of because of the funds that are available. So you know, things I was talking about before, like the the Icelandic witness who recanted their testimony, um, the CIA spying uh, on Julian's lawyers. The extradition treaty here in the in the UK says you can't be extradited for political offences. That's uh, an espionage that's inherently political. Um, so we're appeal- they're appealing Julian's appealing on on that point as well. So it's a very broad appeal uh, to the UK High Court. Uh, and, in, and if that goes ahead, uh, we're probably seeing a hearing um, later this year in the UK. Got it. And so what what is the so the thinking obviously is to hope that that appeal. Um, is taken up. If it's not taken up, is there any chance of lobbying the Australian government, which which recently has has warmed up a bit? I mean, do you get the sense that they're that they're willing to be vocal about it, or what are the chances of that? Because short of the appeal getting taken up, at that point, if there's no intervention on the Australian government side, he would he would be brought back to America, right? Because that would be the last chance. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's also the European Court of Human Rights. So that there's a possible, um, it's, there's potential for an intervention there, but the UK is now trying to wind back its, uh, you know, uh, its involvement with, um, you know, the European Court of Human Rights. So that's sort of on the line now, uh, which is very, very worrying. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, Stella says uh, that extraditions are 95% political and 5% legal. So and Stella is well, Julian Assange's wife, just for those listening. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So what we sort of work really hard at doing is uh, creating the atmosphere for the judges and 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 the politicians to be able to reject reject this uh, extradition. So things like that we're doing at the moment, like traveling around the UK, speaking to people, encouraging them to contact their MPs, getting involved in democratic project process, uh, protests. Um, you know, all things like that, that is like a huge part of stopping this extradition. And if you look at it, Australia, so in Australia, um, around the, at the last poll that was done, 71% of Australians agreed with the statement that Julian should be brought back to Australia. So you see this translated into the number of politicians that at the last election, which was a, a couple of months ago, uh, had free Julian Assange as, as, as part of their platform, as part of their election platform. So the Greens Party in Australia, they had a free Julian, free Julian as part of their platform. They've tripled their number of seats in the lower house. Uh, yeah. In the lower house, um, They've increased their, their numbers in the Senate in Australia. Um, there's a new party or a new party in Australia that will be called the Teals. They went from zero to seven members in the Australian Parliament and they all uh, support Julian being brought home. And so then you have someone like uh, Anthony Albanese, the current prime minister, who's now speaking out and saying, you know, the previous government used to say, well, this is a matter for the UK courts. And now this government is saying this is a diplomatic matter. And so they're making efforts to solve this, uh, to solve Julian's case diplomatically. And so that is that political, that 95% political that I was talking about. And, and that's probably, uh, you know, more important. We need a really good legal team and, and the legal team you know, has to be top level, but it's really this political atmosphere around the extradition uh, that, that will make a difference. And the political cost to uh, in the US as well. So we keep working on that. I was over in the US uh, in June, um, you know, meeting with Congress people on both sides of the aisle. Um, and I think now you've seen in the past two weeks, there's been two bills put forward on Espionage Act reform. So there is this uh, political momentum that is building around this case, and I think that is what it's gonna, that's what's going to take uh, to really put a stop to it. 
Yeah. And, and to wrap up, I mean, I, we haven't addressed this question, but you know, you, you're in touch with Julian. What does he make of all this? I mean, what, what, what did he make of Assange Dao? Um, you know, what, what spirit is he in currently now in terms of, of the future looking forward? And, you know, I suppose like, where's, where's his voice on a lot of these topics at? Yeah, well, I think, you know, Julian's comment after the, after the Assange Dow raise and the NFT purchase was uh, in this David and Goliath battle. David now has a pile of rocks and a sling. So he, he's very, you know, he's, he's worried at the moment because, because of what's happening here in the UK and, 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 you know, the appeal process. But he's also, you know, happy to have this support from all around the world. Um, I just saw him a couple of days ago at the prison and he was, you know, very, you know, it, it was good to see him. So, you know, you go to the prison, sometimes you don't know how you're going to find him. Sometimes you can, uh, you know, you can, you know, sometimes I leave the prison thinking that, oh, shit, you know, I might, I feel like I might never see him again, you know, mm-hmm. like he's in that bad a way. But uh, we found him, we found him on Wednesday in, um, in, in good spirits. He's happy that my father and I are here uh, campaigning uh, and Stella is campaigning and, and everyone around the world is really getting behind this, uh, behind getting him free. So that, that really gives him energy. And, and to leave off this documentary, how can people see this? When is it coming out? Where is it coming out? I know now there's a lot of screenings, but is there a plan to work with any major distributors or release it online? Yeah, so we, we, we're doing, well, you know, we're doing a UK release at the moment. It's, it's out in Australia. If you're in Australia, you can watch it on ABC iView. If you're in the UK, you can come to a cinema. Uh, we're planning to release in the States by the end of the year. Uh, so hopefully we'll be there doing this, doing something similar, traveling around with it, getting in front of people and encouraging them to, you know, do something, um, you know, contact their MPs or, or, you know, join, join the fight to free Julian basically. Um, but yeah, we're rolling it out slowly, uh, around the world. That's amazing. And for crypto people who might want to get involved in the crypto side of things, the current state of Assange Dow. Are you still involved in it? Is, are there plans moving forward with it? Uh, what what state is it in? Yeah, there's still some active members. Um, you know, it has a has a small treasury. Uh, there's still some really good people who are who are planning on doing some things. So yeah, you watch watch what happens over the next four months to Assange Dow. I think uh, you know it's going to come come back to life with a with a new purpose. I think so. But people in the crypto community, if you want to get involved, you can uh, you know jump on the Assange Dow Discord or follow Assange Dow on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter at Gabriel Shipton. Follow Stella. Um, you know we're all we're always posting stuff uh, about the case and what's happening next. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time, Gabriel. I know you're in the middle of a bunch of stuff in the UK between the screenings, and it it was really nice to have you here. So thank you very much for joining. Thanks, Lucinda. This is our podcast episode with Gabriel Shipton of Assange Dow. Please stay tuned for next week when we have another episode coming out. And thank you guys for listening.